Welcome back to the evolution of the invertebrate series. Last week, we chatted about the stramina piles, which included the water molds, several groups of algae, and the diatoms. Today, we're moving on to another fascinating member of the SAR supergroup. So sister to the stramina piles are the alveolates. This group gets its name from the presence of alveoli sacs along the cell membrane that both provide support and allow for flexibility of the pellicle. The alveolata are exceptionally diverse, but we're going to focus on three of the most common groups, the ciliates, the dinoflagellates, and the AP complexins. So the ciliophora includes some of the most recognizable protozoans. Among these are the paramecium, one of the two protozoan genera you've likely heard of, the other being amoeba. They are often used as a general model of protozoan anatomy, and I'll follow suit here. So paramecium is generally oblong with distinct oral groove, sometimes called a food groove, uh, which is lined with cilia and allows food particles to pass into the cytostome, uh, a type of single-celled mouth. Ingestion requires the formation of a food vacuole, which are pinched off from the cytostome and then later digested. Uh, they have two nuclei, a macro and a micronuclei. Uh, the former is polyploid and is involved in cell maintenance and metabolism. The latter is diploid and is considered the germline nu nucleus. Um, the genome within this nucleus is what is passed on to daughter cells. Um, and this way, you can think of the macronucleus as a kind of somatic nucleus, uh, with the micronucleus being the germline one. So reproduction in most ciliates is via binary fission. However, there is an interesting type of genetic recombination that occurs in paramecium called conjugation. It's not quite sex, and it's not quite horizontal gene transfer. It's a kind of strange intermediate. You see, two paramecium of compatible mating types, uh, there's no differentiation of gametes. In fact, they're not even really gametes, but they, they come together and they form a bridged shared cytoplasm. Next, the micronuclei undergoes meiosis, resulting in haploid nuclei, uh, which are then swapped with the paired mate. The new haploid nucleus combines with the original one to form a diploid micronucleus. Uh, the pair then separates, and over time, the micronucleus divides, amplifies, and ultimately replaces the old macronucleus. So in this way, an individual paramecium is changing its genotype in a single generation, similar to the way that sexual reproduction combines genotypes in the next generation. Paramecium were also used as an experimental organism by the Russian Georgi Gauss, who introduced what would become known as the competitive exclusion principle. He never actually called it that himself. Uh, this is an ecological principle that holds that two species occupying the same niche and requiring the exact same resources from the environment uh, will drive one to extinction, i.e. they will be excluded from the environment due to competition. Gauss discovered that when he placed two different species of paramecium on a common medium, one would always drive the other to extinction. Our oldest ciliate fossils are from the Ediacaran, around 580 million years old, which belong to a stunning little group called the Tentinids. These ciliates construct a protonaceous shell called a lorica, a cup-like structure that can take on a myriad of forms. The ciliate itself sits within the cup, occasionally extending its tentacle-like cilia to extract food particles from the water. Other ciliates are oblong, like the heterotrix. These include characteristic genera like stentor and typically have long cilia around the protostome for feeding and movement. Stentor, in particular, is typically found anchored to macroalgae, uh, while some can ingest unicellular green algae, such as members of the genus Chlorella, uh, which then live symbiotically in their cytoplasm, providing nutrients from photosynthesis to the ciliate while feeding on the ciliate's metabolic wastes. Wouldn't it be great if you could just eat a salad and then be able to photosynthesize? The next group of alveolates are the dinoflagellates. However, if you're thinking the prefix dino is the same as that of dinosaurs, you'd be right in that they're both of Greek origin, but wrong in their meaning. The dino in dinosaurs is from dano, which means terrible, whereas dino from dinoflagellates means whirling. 
Uh, since flagellum means whip, the dinoflagellates are literally the whirling whip. Uh, and the name is quite apt. The dinoflagellates have paired flagella that sit within grooves that streak across the hardened case that the critter lives within that is called the theca. In addition to living within the theca, the dinoflagellates have stiffened their cellular membrane with the addition of cellulose to the alveoli. Uh, while they have many different shapes, the typical dinoflagellate has an apical horn and antypical uh, horns. Uh, many dinoflagellates have a curious nucleus that has been called the dinocarion. In most eukaryotes, chromosomes are bound around histones and typically condensed prior only to my mitosis. However, in dinoflagellates, the chromosomes are bound to the membrane itself, and instead of being wound around histones, they are constricted by DVNPs, dinoflagellate viral nucleoproteins. That's right, their histones have been replaced by viral proteins from the phylum Nucleocytovirotica, commonly called the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Unlike many other viruses, these have genes involved in DNA repair, replication, transcription, translation, allowing them to replicate the host's entire genome. This feat likely explains how dinoflagellates were able to lose their histones altogether to these curious viruses, since the viral proteins merely took over the jobs previously carried out by the host cell. Many dinoflagellates also have very large nuclear genomes, some as big as 215 gigabases, more than 60 times the size of a human's. Alternatively, their mitochondria, along with their sister, the AP complexa, which we'll discuss next, are much smaller, with only 6,000 base pairs compared to the 16,000 in most animals. One group of the dinoflagellates, the warwinids, uh, hold the record for the smallest eye of all living things. Uh, the structure is called an ocelloid, and it includes substructures that are very similar to a retina, an iris, a cornea, and a lens. It possesses both a pigmented portion and a translucent one, much like our eyes, uh, with a translucent section being responsible for refraction. The ocelloid is surrounded by a dense ring of mitochondria, as it is no doubt energy intensive. Since most warrenids are predators, it is speculated that it evolved um, to aid in identifying and pursuing prey. Now, like many other protists, various groups of dinoflagellates possess a range of different photosynthetic pigments and thus can take on a variety of colors from green to golden brown to red and blue. Perhaps the most famous of the photosynthetic dinoflagellates are the symbiodinium which are often found within the endoderm of cnidarians, including stony corals. Um, as symbionts of corals, they're collectively called zooxanthellae. When a coral becomes bleached, uh, it is either expelled its zooxanthellae symbiont, or the dinoflagellate itself has lost its chlorophyll. Uh, either of these may be caused by increased ocean temperatures due to anthropogenically driven climate change and ocean acidification. In 1832, Darwin wrote about the dinoflagellates that he had observed off the coast of Chile late at night due to their amazing bioluminescence. Many genera possess scintillons, which are subcellular structures that are capable of generating light. This is achieved by a special enzyme, dinoflagellate luciferase, which binds to luciferin and generates a brief blue to green flash of light. This is generally induced by wave action or boats and can lead to the appearance of a sparkling, glowing light trailing behind a swimmer or ship. Why do they give off light when disturbed? The light itself has no protective value, but what it does is it draws the attention of larger predators. Thus, when a small predator uh, swims into a swarm of dinoflagellates looking to feast, they emit a bright light that attracts a bigger predator to come and eat the smaller one. Hence, it acts as a kind of defense system by turning their own predators into prey. While we've discussed dinoflagellates as symbionts of corals and a visual delight for sailors at night, they are also capable of causing extensive damage to fisheries. Many dinoflagellates produce dinotoxins, a group of neurotoxins that kill fish and mollusks and can affect humans if they're ingested. While dinoflagellates are always 
present to some degree, they've, they're have they only dangerous to fisheries during massive blooms that can reach over a million dinoflagellates per milliliter of water. These blooms are commonly called red tides and may be referred to as algal blooms despite dinoflagellates not technically being algae. On that note, it's perhaps fitting to move on to the last alveolate I'd like to discuss, the AP complexa. All but one group of the AP complexins are endoparasites, and they are responsible for some of the deadliest diseases known to man. The AP complexins get their name from their unique organelle, the apicoplast, a non-photosynthetic plastid that originally derived from an algae, but has since lost its photosynthetic pigment following the switch to a primarily endoparasitic lifestyle. Uh, the organelle is important in many metabolic pathways of the parasites, which has made it a target for drug treatment. Let's discuss the general life history of an AP complexin before diving into a few specific examples. Like many protozoans, they alternate between a sexual and asexual phase. Let's start in the sporogeny phase, just after the formation of the ooconete. This structure initially carries a mass of sporoblasts that slowly begin to differentiate into worm-like sporozoites that are the infectious agent of the parasite. Upon infection, the sporozoites migrate to specific tissue, either in the liver or the intestine, depending on the AP complexin, then enters the cell. Within the cell, the sporozoites form into a kind of sac called a schizont, within which hundreds of merozoites form via asexual reproduction. Eventually, these merozoites burst forth from the schizont and the host cell, generally destroying it, uh, and then go on to invade more cells. Some of the merozoites may form into gametocytes via meiosis, and these become the male and female gametes that, when they fuse, generate a zygote and eventually another ooconete and the next generation of the parasite. For each specific AP complexin, this cycle can be extensively more complex. Let's compare it to the plasmodium life cycle, the causal agent of malaria. The most deadly species of plasmodium is Plasmodium falciparum, and in 2020 alone, there were 240 million cases worldwide, which resulted in over 625,000 deaths. The World Health Organization's report on malaria showed that nearly 95% of all cases and deaths occurred in sub-Saharan Africa. As you probably know, plasmodium is vectored by the Anopheles mosquito. Whenever a mosquito feeds on an infected person, it ingests the, uh, the gametocytes from the blood. Within the midgut of the mosquito, the gametocytes fuse into an ooconete, which eventually matures and generates hundreds of sporozoites. These are released and migrate to the salivary glands of the mosquito. When the mosquito bites an uninfected person, uh, they unwittingly inject the sporozoites into their blood. These then migrate to the liver, where they infect the cells and grow to form the merozoites. The merozoites will subsequently leave the liver, enter the bloodstream, and infect red blood cells. Each round of asexual replication in the merozoites destroys the blood cell and leads to anemia. Symptoms typically include fever, headache, vomiting, and in extreme cases, jaundice, as the parasite also destroys liver tissue. Another nasty AP complexin is Toxoplasma gondii, the causal agent of toxoplasmosis. Like plasmodium, Toxoplasma gondii has a definitive host in which sexual reproduction occurs and an intermediate host in which only asexual reproduction occurs. The definitive host of the parasite are cats, uh, and sexual reproduction occurs in the small intestine. Oocysts are shed in the feces, which are then ingested by the intermediate hosts. This intermediate host can be basically any mammal, but only a few are suitable to the parasite's proliferation, principal among these being mice and rats. In the intermediate host, the merozoites migrate to all the organs and tissues of the body, including the brain, and many studies have shown that Toxoplasma gondii can influence the behavior of its host. A principal example of this is that many rodents infected with the parasite become partial to cat odor, and they become more inquisitive and less afraid, which increases their chances of being eaten by cats and therefore passing the parasite on to its definitive host. 
In humans, the parasite migrates to the brain and forms little cysts where it will live generally dormant for the rest of the person's life. While a healthy adult doesn't generally show symptoms of infection, infants or individuals with a weakened immune system can develop severe infections. Uh, symptoms are often flu-like initially, but can lead to encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, and a necrotizing retinochoroiditis, uh, which can result in, in blindness. Infants infected can be born with nasal malformations, uh, and it's generally recommended that pregnant women stay away from cat litter. In the United States, approximately 11% of the population is infected by Toxoplasma gondii. That's more than 1 in 10 people. Worldwide, a study in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization found that up to 50% of all humans are infected, with around 200,000 cases of infants born with congenital toxoplasmosis each year. In this episode, we have discussed the incredibly diverse alveolata, touching on the ciliophora, the dinoflagellata, and the AP complexa. We reviewed some curious ciliates, dazzling dinoflagellates, and awful AP complexans. Next time, we'll finish up the SARS supergroup with a discussion of the rhizaria, which include familiar groups such as the foraminifera and the radiolaria, a pair of important shell-building protozoans that have left extensive fossil records. Thanks so much for being here, and I'll see you next time.